undo reality. On a more optimistic future. Hi everyone, welcome to Cosmic. Human beings on planet Earth getting together and figuring out what the hell is going on here. It feels like we can't share a cookie without colonizing or discriminating each other. Really? Come on, aren't we better than this? Today we're talking about post-colonialism, waste trade, African art and craft. Wait, what do those themes have to do with each other? Well, I invited someone who is deeply connected to these topics and who is working to shift the paradigm in her own way. She's a visual artist and surface designer based in Casablanca, Morocco. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sukaina Aziz Elidrisi. Hello, Suki. Hi. How are you? That's a great introduction. I'm brilliant. How are you? Yes, very good. Um, you're in Tangier. You're, you're not in danger. You're in Tangier. Can you explain where that is? I'm in, <laughs> I'm in Tangier. I'm in Tangier, yes, which is in the north of Morocco. Yes. What are you doing there? Um, well, okay. I don't I don't have... No, I'm just chilling with a friend and getting some work done and talking craft with a few other people. Yeah. Talking craft. That's what we. I hope we're going to do together here uh, today. Um, so I have to say we, we kind of work together. Like, is it okay to say that we, we're... We work together. Yeah, we have a project. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What do you know? So, should, so, so uh, today maybe it's going to be more of a, um, a casual uh, conversation compared compared to the more uh, formal interviews that I, I'm doing sometimes. But I really wanted to cover a number a number of themes that are extremely important uh, and that should really be in the radar of the cosmic uh, community. Uh, we're going to talk about African art, African craft, post-colonialism, waste trade and exports, uh, zero waste communities and, you know, the various materials that are being shipped to the global south and dumped in the global south um, and trying to weave in uh, different ideas and express, explain what those topics have to do with each other. Uh, you're a good person for that. Uh, how So you are yourself... Uh, you are um, trained as a weaver, right? Uh, you're a visual artist and surface designer. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing as an artist uh, to set the stage? Sure. So, yeah, as you said, I trained as a as a weaver um, and I work solely with plastic waste that's non-recyclable on an industrial scale. So everything that is really destined for the landfill or in certain places in the world um, incineration, which is really, really bad. Um, louder. Which is really, I'm really asking bad. You to speak is a bit that louder? loud yeah. enough? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I transform plastic waste, as I said, that's non-recyclable on an industrial scale into surfaces, some that are woven, others that aren't, uh, and into sculptures and immersive installations. So it goes from a tiny little piece that size made out of what I like to call unicorn snot because it looks, really, it looks like what, it, what I believe a unicorn would sneeze um, and when you work <laughs> it it looks like a nebula I can show you at some point in time it's pretty sweet uh, the tiny pieces to massive monumental installations the largest one that I've done was a few years ago um, made out of 17 tons of compressed plastic bottles in the shape of a labyrinth a maze and 17 tons wow. is the amount of waste produced by one Moroccan in their lifetime. Um, so say I live about 80, 85 years, I'm very optimistic. I would produce, if I were to consume and dispose of, of stuff uh, in an average way, I would produce 17 tons of, of waste, which is quite a bit. Which is a lot, no? yeah. But so you're using, so clearly... Uh, you're using your your art uh, form as a as a vehicle for very strong uh, messages. When did you 
find out that this was well possible and that what you wanted to do and you started to like because this is always a scary turn for artists to just go full time and um you know aim for yeah the stars. i'm not sure i can do anything else man this is it for me. <laughs> yeah. no, I can't. right so when when did that happen and how did um, that happen and i always wanted to go to to art school so i made that happen for myself which wasn't necessarily the easiest thing because i come from from a a background where art isn't necessary it's not a job it's a hobby um it's fun <laughs> you don't make a living out of that surely um and I, while i was weaving i got in i specialized in weave um i realized i was actually allergic to a lot of the materials i was working with so linen cotton wool all of your your materials so i spent most oh yeah yeah, but I'm melting, melting too. plastic, that's not know? a problem, right? That's going to backfire at some point in time. Fast forward <laughs> well, three years where I'm hooked up to a gazillion <laughs> machines. Like one is digesting my food. The other one's breathing for me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there. <laughs> Cosmic episode 60,523. Uh, 60, um, so, yeah, I, I was allergic. Yeah. I spent most of my time sneezing and it was just a pain. So I got interested in, in working with what are called smart materials. So looking at nanotechnology and optical fibers and all of those fancy schmancy words that cost a lot of money. Um, and so for my final year, I was like, Oh, well, that's what I'm going to do, except I couldn't afford it. And as I mentioned earlier, reading and writing is not my jam. So sitting down and writing proposals to be able to get funding for it was not an option. So I decided to just sift through my waist and see what I could use there that was not going to make me sneeze and wasn't going to cost me an arm and a leg. So I started working with all sorts of waste. And it kind of related to what I used to do when I was living back home uh, in Morocco. So I studied in London. So this is in two different countries. Uh, and when I was in Morocco as a teenager, right. I was always fiddling around with stuff, making stuff out of whatever I could get my hands on because – you'd go into an art shop and it was mostly paints and markers and a bit of clay and plaster, but it was still not materials that I was comfortable with. So I just end up walking into the kitchen and taking a broken pan and a pile of nails and it's art. Look, yeah. it's art. <laughs> um, I went back to doing that, except this time I was sifting through old projects and looking at stuff that I could eventually use as a weaving material. So yeah. it started off with all kinds of waste. And as I furthered my research, I realized that plastic was the only one really waste material that never really had a full circle. Wood, metal, glass, all of those are natural organic materials. Not that plastic isn't organic because it kind of is, it comes from petroleum, but it's been so meddled with that it's lost its its naturalness and ends up being, well, it's just, it never goes back into, into nature the way it came out. Right. And being in design school and being taught that as a designer, you're a problem solver. So you have a set of limitations, which is called a brief, and you're supposed to come up with solutions uh, for those problems. I was like, all right, well, I'll just focus on, on plastic. That seems like a fun challenge. And then next thing you know, I'm an environmentalist. Hmm. Right, um, so we'll, we'll we're going to dive more into this, but also concurrently, I suppose, uh, because of your uh, background in Morocco and and um, the the power of the craft uh, sector over there, or at least traditionally, the the very strong presence of uh, crafty uh, products and 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 it's and their role in in culture probably also helped you sort of, I mean. You had that. You you had that connection as well, right? So, growing up, it wasn't necessarily something that caught my eye. I always thought it was pretty. It's beautiful. I mean, look at that. That's, that's pretty sick, handmade. Yeah, in your background for those watching. And on it looks exactly the same on the other side. It takes hours to make. It's beautiful. Anywho, um, yeah, I was always surrounded by beautiful stuff growing up. I'm very very grateful and privileged to, to have that growing up in Morocco we are surrounded by beautiful craftsmanship but it wasn't necessarily something that I 
paid attention to when I was a kid. It was more once I actually went to London and started studying weave that I was like, oh, wait, we got this shit back home. Wait, can I curse on this? Too? <laughs> Fantastic. You can curse on the show. So I was like, wait, we've got a load of this crap back home. And then sort of kind of started, ooh, hey, you're drinking from a mug from Fez. That's See. handmade as well. See, I got my, my Moroccan uh, yeah, crafty mug. Uh, for those watching on YouTube, I'm showing oh, it to the yeah. camera. Yeah, so you, you connected the dots. You were like, wait a minute, I come so from a country where and this and is that's kind of, kind of, of how I started researching it so it ha i had to leave my country to realize what i had in my country which is something that often happens in in places like morocco um yeah. we grow up in an environment where we're constantly bombarded by all things western that you kind of i don't know if we forget about it or we take it for granted but something happens there's a shift in, in dynamics where what we appreciate is not necessarily what's what's ours between quotations yeah, absolutely. I have the same story with, it's, it's going to sound really, really cliche, but I have the same story with <laughs> croissant. I'm French. <laughs> and I never, I never, I never. I think what happens as well is that you see something, like you probably tasted a croissant somewhere and you're like, this is disgusting. What is this? This is like the, the, the crappiest imitation of it. We've got so much better back home. And then you start like delving into like, the technicalities and the beautifulness of how it's made and all of that. So that's what happened to me where I did not that I, the craft that I saw in, in, in England was crap. It is not, it's fantastic. But I was just looking at it and going like, I've, I feel like I've seen a, a, a similar version of like a different way of doing this, but that same, but different, but also the exact same back home. And then that kind of pushed me to research that further. So my connection with craft actually happened when I started learning how to weave.
Okay, so you were saying that you, you started to do a lot of research about uh, craft and this whole space that you knew but you didn't really know actually. And what did you what did you find out? What were some of the key realizations that then well influence your work and what you're doing right now? The main one was that it's fucking awesome. Craft is really just it's genius. Everything is so simple. Why is it? Why is if you need to explain it to someone who doesn't know anything about it? Why? why so is when it you look at a beautifully crafted piece, it looks extremely complicated. It looks very, very complex and very, very sophisticated. Whether it's a plaster wall ceiling or or woodworks or a tapestry or carvings or whatever, it looks extremely intricate and complex. But the actual technique behind it is always very, very simple. It's very, very simple. And it's especially in, in, in Morocco, and this is not it doesn't it doesn't work for it doesn't go for all Moroccan craft because we do have a huge range and diversity of craft from region to region. So the craft that you see, for instance, here in Tangier is completely different from the one that you'll see in Marrakesh or the one that you're going to see further south uh, around what is that or Zagura, just completely different from the one that you'll see in Fez. But if there's one thing that connects all of them, it's the simplicity and the actual technique of it. It's it, There's a lot of repetition. And in that repetition, you're able to add complexity to to a crafts piece. Um, but that's what really, really struck me is, mm. is the simplicity of, of how it's done. And when I say simplicity, I'm talking about the technicality of it, the tools that are used, the spirit that you 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 kind of get into when you're making you almost bec you kind of especially for weaving with me uh, for me it kind of becomes you go into a trance state because of the repetition of the work because of the yeah you kind of into a trance it's it's almost spiritual yeah. where you transcend what you're doing it's really Really cool. I've gotten into a lot of trouble because of that, where I'd like start working on on something or another, and I have a meeting in in an hour, and I'll just weave away. And next thing you know, three hours have passed. I've missed my meeting, probably lost a friend because I felt like I was only doing it for thirty minutes. Um, hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, is the fact that is that it is so simple in terms of its technicality and, and that it's more about repetition. May, is this what makes it a, such a vulnerable sector to machinery? That makes sense, to doesn't it? Or? It does, because the machine will do it quicker. I just want to go back to, to one thing where I said at the, the simplicity of it, and I don't want to diminish or downsize the importance of of the technicality behind craft, not at all. When I say simple, I, I use that as a... It's a It's a positive quality because that's where the genius lies. In in Moroccan craft, a lot of, of it is very geometric. So you basically just have one tiny segment that you repeat over and over and over and over again. If you look at mosaics and whatnot, <clears throat> you can have a wall that's like in five meters by 10 meters. And it's you look at it and you're completely blown away by by the amount of colors and, and the shapes that those colors create and whatnot. But it's really just one tiny thing that's repeated several times. And then you tweak it a tiny bit and then you repeat that a thousand times and you end up with this extraordinary complex thing that takes hours and hours to make, but that is just absolutely stunning. And you feel like you can, you can dive into it and swim right. into infinity. And is and that specific? Really Sorry, go ahead. No, that's what, that was like the first thing that really yeah, got you. caught me when, when I was, because I was also in it because I had started to weave as well, where I was like, oh, shit, that's why, that's why they do what they do. Mm, mm. It's because it's, it's a form of meditation almost. It's that element of, of diving into, into a thing and, and time not being of a thing really almost. Do that makes sense. It's just. You're making this stuff. You're doing this thing. You figure it out. This knot or this this movement of the hands and with your legs and your feet or your toes or whatever, and you're holding it with your tooth to keep it in place. And, da, da, da. and so you're using your body to make this one thing. And I think that's what links. Oh, hello. That's what links. Um, that's what links all craft, and not just in Africa, but in the whole of the world. That human aspect. With everything else, it's just tiny little differences. It's kind of like a gradient of this one shape, 
mm-hmm. story, but it's, mm-hmm. it's still, so that makes sense. Yeah. I, I would I would argue that from a, a cosmic uh, perspective, if we received visitors from another planet, and they would be well, I'm talking about Earth, the chance, Yeah, yeah, no, but I, I'm arguing that if we had visitors from another planet, they would be much more interested in in products from the the craft sector than in products from yeah the mall. Or what do you think? Okay, I like this. I like this. Okay, this, uh, okay. <laughs> next question. <laughs> Tell me about the 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 craft sector um, in in Africa in general, and, and maybe referring to the stories you know in your country and, and how it evolved over time, like pre colonialism uh, until until now, and the, the the place of the craft sector in society. Because yeah, there are some really big challenges around that. Right. So what I I came to the realization through several discussions with a few people that uh, are working specifically on that, I'm kind of looking looking at the difference between craft and art in Morocco specifically. Uh, but I think that it applies to the rest of, of, of the continent or really any country that's gone through that process of being colonized is that when the colonials came, they kind of came with a perception of what art was and what craft was. They kind of defined, they they came to this new territory and defined things according to their standards. And so craft at that point took a huge, huge kick where it wasn't considered art, even if it was Because everything artistic was artistic, was, uh, like from... I mean, from the from, from from your perspective or, or from from uh, the perspective of the sector at the time um there, there was no dissociation between art and craft it was art i don't think there was that vocabulary being used i don't think that there was that level of semantics where this is art and this is craft and this is design or this is that and this is a it's a spoon that I beautifully made because why the hell not? <laughs> it's a carpet that I hand wove with wool that I dyed myself because I have sheep and I need a thing to keep me warm when it's freezing outside and this does it and I'm going to have to live with it. So I'm going to make it look fucking amazing. And then obviously, you know, I'm super simplifying this, but there's, there's the whole, visual heritage that comes with it so that it looks this way and not that way. But ultimately, yeah, they were pieces of art, but they were functional. They were used on a daily basis. They weren't as precious as art is today in the contemporary sphere where, you know, I mean, if you buy a piece of art, some, some, like some of that stuff is ridiculously expensive. I mean, life goals one day, probably after I'm dead, but Hey, who knows? Um, So, yeah, when the colonials came, they were like, no, that's not art. That's craft. Art is paintings that you put on an easel. And so that kind of shifted what art was in Morocco as well, where all of a sudden we had had loads and loads and loads of painters that did beautiful, amazing, amazing work. But that was removed from, from what we knew as art before art was introduced to us as something that you put on an easel. And nowadays we've got more and more artists bringing craft back into the contemporary art sphere and, and challenging that notion of art is not a thing that you put on an easel, but art can be a a tapestry. Art can be a beautiful handmade wooden table or stool or chair or whatever. And so we're, Basically, what I'm saying is, yeah, so when the colonials came, there was a redefinition of what those things were, those things that we had, that we'd use on a daily basis that were beautifully crafted, that were art piece, pieces of art, all of a sudden were given a lesser value. A, a, right. They were lesser than. And were dissociated and from, from what is considered mother, modern life. Absolutely. It was, yeah, it's not, it's, it's ethnetic, it's. It's made by by the savages, by the barbarians. Mm. 
flag tickets. Interesting. So what's Indigenous. what's the position of of uh, where where are we today? Like from what does it feel like to uh, interact with people in the craft sector today? And what are um, um, I suppose you still feel the separation very strongly with well the art markets for sure, but also like what's the place of craft today in 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 the society it's taken a toll because it's been taking a toll for such a long time that you know even after the colonials have left there was still a reminiscence not a reminiscence that's not a right word but um le sequel. yeah like um what is that word shit there's a word not we don't know in in english sorry Les séquelles for the French uh, French speakers. The anyway, yeah. Google. The, we'll put a link. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's Google it one second. Google séquelles. Let me put uh, some sounds for ten seconds. Yeah. Yeah, it's the the after effects, the the aftermath in a way. Yeah, I was thinking of like ricochet. We'll put the link to our uh, official <laughs> dictionary. Thank you to Collins. Um, yeah, the aftermath. The it's, aftermath, still the, and, and the yeah. fact that it's been instilled that modernization or modernity is is what comes from out there. It's not what we have here. We are behind. And we have to right. catch up and craft is way the fuck too slow. And so kind of was left behind. Yeah. And so now uh, we're posing here on, on the, where we are in the, in the craft sector, uh, because then concurrently to this happening, uh, there's the waste colonialism issue going on and and then we'll sort of resolve and, and sort of wrap them together and 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 jam a little bit around uh how you're thinking um on on how the two uh, sort of link uh together so waste colonialism for for dummies uh if you lived in a cave uh for the last years you probably don't know that uh that's uh, waste and plastic and what we call uh, plastic recycling or textile recycling is actually traded on markets and are, those are commodities that end up in um, mega dumps or um, sort of, uh, yeah, shady markets uh, in the global south uh, and eventually ends up, ends up in, the, in the ocean. I'm, I'm taking uh, a few shortcuts, but... Uh, in Africa, how does it look like? They are, they, they, this is something that has been the profile of the issue has been raising over the last what twenty years. Um, is that accurate? I think so. Yeah, there's been a lot of media attention on what's happening in in Southeast Asia at the moment with regards to um, waste trade and and waste dumping. Um, And it got a huge, huge, huge media boost right after China kind of closed its doors to the rest of the world going like, we don't want your trash. And so other Southeastern um, countries are, are closing the door. Asian countries were like, oh, we'll take it. And then actually, they're like, actually, no, we won't take it. So they've been shipping stuff back. And now the most logical place to send it is, is Africa. And it's been the case already for several years now. It's just, Increasing, not titled as waste um, trade or waste dumping. It's kind of been packaged differently, but I see it as still being the same. I kind of, I see waste dumping. I kind of break it down into three categories. So the first one is your generic fill a container up of full of, of waste that you're going to send off to somewhere to be recycled or whatever. You just don't want to deal with it. So you send it off. That's one way of dumping. The second way of dumping is, um, 
for me, the double standards of, of corporations. So for instance, in Europe, you will very, very, very rarely find little sachets of, of shampoo or, or soap or little cafe thingies. That are sold by units. That for me, you know, for those who don't know, that yeah, is, it's yeah, the units, units exactly. uh, sachets well, that are sold uh, with the argument of, you know, making the product affordable for the poor because they cannot buy big yeah, quantities. Yeah. With that notion in mind. Um, and what's actually ridiculous is oftentimes within the price, the product that you're actually using, so the soap, the coffee or whatever, costs more than the pack, less than the packaging. And then you add on the fact that you have to now manage the waste of this packaging. That adds even more costs to it so it, they're not it's not helpful it's dumping again and then the the third and final form of dumping i i feel is um sending secondhand goods to poor little africans right um like the computer that doesn't work anymore like a computer that doesn't work but it's not waste the second hand except you buy it it right. blows up in your face what are you going to do you're going to throw it out it ends right. up in a land it's being dumped right. same for clothes for shoes for for so many products that are being shipped from the global north to the global south it's like well we don't want them anymore you look like you might need them have them and it might come from a good intention but the consequences of it the aftermath is not helpful it ends up just sort of burying populations under a pile of of ways that the global north decided we don't really want or need or want to deal yeah. with. So that's the third uh, kind. Yeah. So the yeah. first one is just fill a container up and send it down, send it down south because who cares? Yeah. Uh, second double one. Double standard. Yeah. Second uh, uh, double standards of corporations, and the third one is sending off stuff under the title of secondhand goods. I, I would argue there's a fourth one. Uh, there are those those um, those programs uh, and um, this money coming from the north to the south to uh, set up infrastructure and recycling programs between uh, quotation marks where um, you know uh, Western countries are coming to help set up infrastructure that you know is not existing in those countries and they obviously don't know how to take care of their ways blah 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 let's help them and let's also bring in the financing and lock in communities into waste management contracts for the yeah. 40 years to come um, and and solve the waste problem with incinerators and others so that's a form also of, of colonialism uh, that's more industrial um, and it and it works so beautifully well with continuing to send waste in those three ways that I mentioned first, because it just means that they'll be able to fuel their businesses even more. And so why not go and set up incinerators to set up energy to waste or waste to energy, although it is energy to waste yeah. um, solution, like false solutions. Yeah. And so you, you are personally uh, quite involved uh, with uh, with this as well, um, uh, with um, um, an NGO uh, that is working to install uh, zero waste, yeah, uh, zero waste systems in across Morocco. Can you say a few words about this? And then I play a song, and then we st start to link okay. things together. So the NGO is called Zero Zbil, which translates to zero waste in uh, the Moroccan Arabic dialect, which is Derijan. And what we look at is basically filling in the information gap with all things related to waste management or lack thereof within, in Morocco. Um, all things related to the environment, really. Not all, but a lot of things related to the environment. Every single time we sit down and try to research, you know, try to find numbers related to, the, to our country, to our situation specifically, there is nothing out there because the research hasn't been done, because it's not a priority. Uh, and so we end up with data from France or from America, from China or from wherever, but not from Morocco and very rarely from another country within the continent. And so our goal really was to do that. Well, that's what we're doing. We're trying to gather that information that we feel is important for, to be able to put in place proper solutions and prevent false solutions to be instigated or imposed within our context. And this is something that definitely 
within the work that we've done because we're part of a global network of um, of NGOs and we work very closely with other NGOs across the continent. We realize that that is one thing that we all have in common, where we sit down and try to strategize all together and come up with a narrative that we can all work towards. And we're like, well, shit, we don't have the data for that narrative because we just no one's no one's done that research or or it's been done but it's not handed down to us for whatever reason so that's that's basically our main our main our focal thing is to try to gather information any way we can without getting in the way of the powers that be and disseminate it all you're doing a lot of things how does all this come together after the break <laughs> on Cosmic. <laughs> <laughs> So today, wherever you go in the world, you talk about plastic waste and someone has something to say about it. It's there. Everyone can relate to this thing that is called plastic waste. And in my research, I was like, all right, so it connects to it. But where does it come from, really? Where does it really, really come from? What is this a result of? Sure, it's a result of industrialization. Okay, fantastic. What is industrialization a result of? Why do we keep producing the way that we produce, even if we know that it is more harmful than it is less harmful? And then you realize it's because we're in this dynamic of, of exploiting, of, of dominating and exploiting, which is coloniality. It's, it's, some, it's, 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 it's exactly, sure, yes, we're in a post-colonial era, but really it's just colonialism 2.0. It's been packaged differently, marketed differently, but it's still there because it is still a matter of 
finding a territory, a population, a resource, dominating it, exploiting it, and not really caring of the of, of the consequences because you're very much in a mindset of mindset of exponentiality. More, 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 more. And this more, 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 more led to a huge, huge amount of single waste, single use plastic waste being everywhere. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all connected. And, and basically what I can say, so if you allow me to uh, unveil a little bit more, because I, I told on the show um, a few episodes ago that um, Cosmic Beyond the, the podcast and media that we're starting to roll out uh, at at scale, I mean, there's a podcast. There's more coming. I'll I'll talk about this separately. But um, we're also uh, working on uh, funding instruments and what are new ways that um, that funding projects can happen uh, beyond the more uh, conventional um, philanthropy um, practices and um, how can we. Uh, best support projects that truly shift the paradigm and and help uh, with the facilitation of those projects at the early stage. And here, really, what we're talking about is is you know denunciating the impact of, of waste colonialism in in a way that um, that uplifts uh, traditions, cultures, and and all those skills and 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 talents that are populating the the African craft sector, right? Is that a, a, that's kind of the what we're talking about here, and we cannot say too much yet. But yeah. uh, you know, how how do we shift the paradigm and and those common perceptions that are that are blocking the way uh, towards you know a dynamic sector that is fair, uh, socially just, and um, and uh, yeah, uh, with with some emphasis on on craftswomen uh, actually. Maybe we should uh, dedicate an episode to, to to that piece. I mean, I want to start on Cosmic to to, to bring in more um, conversations like this one that are about the projects that we're uh, carrying carrying out on the side, um, and then we'll also keep going with the more uh, conventional interviews. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, how should, should we? do more of this like maybe um at the later stage dedicate an episode to the to to a more detailed view on different aspects of the project as, as it rolls out are you up for it i think so yeah because i mean most of the the projects that you're looking at at the cosmic foundation my the the kind of ethos of, of the foundation is to be able to fund projects that are grouping all sorts of different things together that are connecting dots to be actually able to to create a, a paradigm shift because we can't create a paradigm shift if we're tackling an issue from just one angle we have to tackle it from different angles and we have to have different brain bits coming together to think differently on one matter so obviously yeah, it, it makes total sense that each like you could have different episodes focusing on one specific aspect or one specific person that's working on that project that's part of a, a collective or part of a, of a team of other people that are working on that exact same product or project but on a completely different sphere and then it kind of helps feed into you know because that's what a paradigm is. It's a whole lot of st yeah. stuff. But I think the listeners are hating us by now because we're kind of saying a lot but not saying anything because we don't want to fully reveal. Um, so I'll say that for now, you can go on becosmic.org slash foundation to get the generic um, spiel on, on you know what the foundation is uh, interested in. And, uh, you know, really trying to yeah aggregate and organize the most effective tools and tactics from across uh, different silos um and and co-design and facilitate projects that uh yeah that re deliver disproportionate outcomes we'll talk in extreme detail about this in due time so thank you all for your patience and uh so kind you will be back very soon um i'm going to uh make a plan uh, for a next interview where we can dive much deeper into the specifics 
of some of the topics you've talked about. Thanks so much for uh, sharing all this. It's uh, fascinating. Yeah, fascinating what you're working with. And the trauma has proper references.